Okay. Good evening, everybody. So, about the essay, uh, the essay on the short stories, now I wanted to read you the two short stories. It's, this is going to be a long video, but don't worry, it is going to be nice and interesting as, as those two stories are really nice and they represent um, a lot of values that you can find now in the post-apartheid South Africa. She doesn't speak. Marita van der Weyer. Her name is Anuk, and she doesn't speak. That is how my mother always introduces me to other people. My name is Noekia. I always say it without say it without moving my lips or making a sound. I speak all the time in my head to myself. If anybody wants to know to know more about it, she would say, "No, she isn't dumb." Almost casually, as if there was nothing strange about a fourteen-year-old who doesn't speak. She stopped speaking after experiencing a traumatic incident. Usually people don't ask any more questions after that, at least not immediately. Usually they will be scared off by the words traumatic incident. But later, if they wanted to know more, she will tell them everything. Like a tap that had been opened, the words will just pour from her. How the robbers burst into our lunch one evening and shot my father dead, and how she was seriously wounded, and how I saw it all while I was hiding behind the kitchen door with the maid, Rebecca. How Rebecca had pushed me behind the door and had held her hand over my mouth, while Dad's blood stained the Persian carpet. How she had tried to crawl to her, hand, to her handbag to get to her cell phone, while the robbers were searching the bedroom for money or jewels or whatever they were looking for. How she pretended to be dead when they came back into the lounge. You see what I mean. I don't need to speak. My mother speaks enough for both of us. The robbers had oddly looked at her. They had run out through the veranda door when they saw a car with a blue light patrolling the street. It was a security company's car, a routine patrol, like there was every evening. But the robbers probably didn't know about this. They had probably thought that one of the neighbors had heard suspicious sounds. Usually, when my mother gets to this part of the story, she gives a dejected little laugh. Even if someone had suspected anything, she would add, they wouldn't have been able to see anything from the street. A few months before, my husband had built a high wall around the property to protect us. My mother believes that the more you talk about a difficult thing, the easier it will be to bear. My mother and all the psychologists I have already seen. But as yet, no one has been able to tell me about what you should do when it is so difficult that you simply can't talk about it. In the beginning, I really tried. Forcing the sounds out of my throat like dry vomit. They said that if I forced myself to speak about it, I would stop dreaming about it. But after a few awful sessions with a psychologist, the nightmares just got worse. It was Rebecca who dialed the emergency number and got the ambulance to come. Saved my life. An annex if the child had made a single sound. What my mother doesn't say is that maybe we could have saved my father's life too. Maybe if I had slipped out the back door and called the neighbors, if I had stayed calm and done something. 
if I had just acted like Buffy against the vampires or someone like that. But I went rigid, scared stiff, mute. And that is why we are living in England now. That is how my mother always ends her story, as if the attack was the only reason why we had left. She doesn't say that she had wanted to go and live in England long before the attack. Her father was British, and she had the right passport. She had always stood with one foot in the sea, ready to emigrate. Every time she read a newspaper heading that scared her, it was my father who didn't want to go. He loved this country. So did I. I'm not going anywhere, Dad had said in his quiet way, over my dead body. Then he died. And then we left. It's almost three years since we moved. We live in a quiet village east of London where everything is so green that after a while you start longing for something pale and dry to look at. Brown soil that has been baked dry, this is what I miss. Soil that burns your feet, like on my father's family farm in the free state, pale veiled in a cloudless sky and a taste of dust. My mother doesn't miss anything, at least that is what she says. She didn't even want to come back on a holiday. I think she is scared to see all the things she misses. But now we are here on a holiday because she thinks it will be good for me. She wants to see me laugh again, but we have been back for a week already and I still haven't seen anything that makes me want to laugh. Doesn't she want to talk? asks one of my mother's friends. She wears far too much makeup. All my mother's old friends from Pretoria wear, wear far too much makeup. But this one's neck almost naps from all the mascara. Or is it that she can talk? I'm sitting on the other side of the same room, room reading. People seem to think that if you can speak, you also can hear. After a while, they don't see you anymore. I've become used to being treated like a piece of furniture. At school, too, the kids talk right over my head, look right past me as if I'm not there. It's probably a combination of factors, my mother replies, giving her, what did I do to deserve such a, da such a daughter? Sick. At first, she couldn't speak, and then she didn't want to anymore. And now, who knows? Doesn't she know how lucky she is to be living in England? Lashes heavy with mascara flutter and she utters a forced little laugh. I wish I could leave this country. Anuk won't be happy anywhere, my mother says after another long drawn art sick. Not until she has worked through the past. Work through the past, a combination of factors, a traumatic experience. My mother uses words like bricks to build walls around her, to protect herself, as if she doesn't know that walls cannot protect one. Anuk is another one of her bricks. Anuk isn't me. Anuk is someone exotic, worldly. My mother's dream daughter with long dark hair. I'm not exotic. I'm small and ordinary. My hair is short and my face bare. I wear boys' clothes and like to walk barefoot even in England where no one does that. People generally think that I'm two years younger than my real age. I can't help it. I don't look like someone called Anik. And I don't feel like someone called Anik. And a psychologist? Asks my mother's friend. Couldn't they help? No, Miss Mascara. The, the psychologists couldn't help. After a while, I refused to go. Refused to try and vomit out words. And once everybody started to leave me alone, 
I also, I also had fewer nightmares. They weren't less terrible, just less frequent. When they do come at night, it is still un as unbearable as ever. Blood on the carpet, everything, furniture and walls, like brown red paint. Blood that streams out of the front door and runs down the street. Streets of blood, rivers of blood, a country full of blood. Then, I also make strange noises in my sleep. My mother says gargling, rattling noises, like words in a language that doesn't exist. Sometimes I sob loudly and then my mother shakes me softly, waking me up and holding me. Sometimes she cries with me. I loved my father. My mother, my mother probably did too. I don't know. Nowadays she is going out with another man. That was tall and thin with a soft voice. My mother's new friend is short and stocky. Well, actually, he's quite fat. But my, mother's, my, but my mother describes him as short and stocky. He likes to laugh loudly. He tries terribly hard to be nice to me. It's probably quite difficult to be nice to someone like me. I wish I were someone else. No. I wish I was myself. Three years ago, when Dad was still alive, and we still lived in Pretoria, and I could stand barefoot in the kitchen in the afternoon, and watch Rebecca iron the washing, I wish I could turn back the clock by ele be eleven years old again, and listen to the hissing of the steam iron while I make myself a peanut butter sandwich, forever and ever. And now my mother has a stupid idea that she wants to go and look at our old house. Or rather, at the wall around the, around the house. Because that is all that you can see from the street. She has brought along my granny Anna to give her psychological support. Support to look at a wall? I have forgotten how dry the high veld gets in winter. My mother says, as we drive past the Vertrekker, the Fur Tracker mo Monument, Alert from or maybe Rover it just three. looks paler because we have become used to a place that is always green. Because it always rains. Because the sun never shines properly, not like it shines here in Africa. The grass on the other side is always greener, mumbles Granny Anna. Not for me. I miss the pale grass on the side of the fence. I'm sitting in the back of the car, staring at the high, pale blue sky, drinking in the air as if it were a winter, if it were water. When last did I see such a wild, cloudless sky? The closer we get to our old suburb, the slower mom drives, and the faster she talks, almost without breathing. Her fingers clutching onto the steering wheel. Just look at all those fences. The burglar bars and the security gates. The alarm systems and the vicious dogs behind the gates. I'm sure it wasn't so bad here three years ago. Three years ago you just didn't notice it because you were used to it, Granny says. Familiarity breeds contempt. Dad always used to say that Granny Anna had swallowed a book of idioms when she was small. I sometimes wonder if she has any of her own words left in her hand. Three years ago, I didn't feel contempt, Mom. I thought it was normal to live like this. Now I live in a village where no one hides behind security gates, where the dogs sound friendly when they bark. Maybe their bite is worse than their bark, Granny says with a dry laugh. My mother doesn't catch the joke. She doesn't even listen to what Granny is saying. She's far too worked up. I never want to live here again. What you, sh what you sow you shall reap, mumbles Granny. Mother glares at her, irritated. I didn't sow the crime in this country, Mom. The sins of the fathers. I'd never noticed before how much they looked alike from the back. 
Both have short, dark and smooth hair, small ears and thin necks. Their voices also sound quite similar. They say that I also lo look like my mother. It's hard to believe because she always wears dark red lisp lipstick and black coal around her eyes, which makes her look, well, quite exotic. I can't remember what my voice sounds like. I was never much of a chatterbox anyhow. My mother was always the talker in the house, and my father and I understood each other without having to say anything. Dad, me and Rebecca. When I was small, I asked many questions, but when I was about seven, I noticed that I could get more answers from books than from people, and so I started reading more and more and spoke less and less. You know what it's like to live in a country where you don't have to be scared all the time. I refuse to live in fears, anarchy. The only thing to fear is fear itself. As we turn into our old road, my mother breathes in sharply. I remember the trees, many of them now pale and naked, but in summer they form a green canopy over the pavement. How I used to jump from shade to shade on my, way, on my way to the cafe. Barefoot, trying not to get my feet burnt to the cement. My heels were almost as rough as Becca's. My mother had bought me a grey stone to scrape my feet soft at night in the bath. But I never used it. I wanted to have feet like Becca's, soles that aren't hurt on the, sh on the cement. Hills that can step on pieces of glass and thorns. We stop in front of the house, the one on the left hand side, on the corner. We stare at the high white wall and the red signs of two different security companies. The black steel gate that opens with a remote from inside the house. The driveway gate which also opens with a remote. My mother's shoulders are shaking. She is crying. My grand takes her hand, turns around and gives me a worried smile, as if, I, as if concerned that I too will start crying. I get out of the car, I'm hot and I don't want to watch my mother cry because I can't bear the expression in grand's eyes, as if she has forgiven me everything, will always love me even if I never say another word. I stumble across the pavement, all along the white wall, around the corner where they can't see me. My eyes are filled with tears. My ears are filled with the familiar sounds of the street. The sound of a lone mower and the soft hum of the pool cleaners and the barking of the dogs behind the gates. Not friendly dogs, not here. Voices from the radios in the kitchens usually Zulu or Sesotho, sometimes English or Afrikaans, screaming sirens in the distance in another suburb on the highway, I had forgotten about all the sirens. On the farthest side of the property, there is a smaller iron gate that Rebecca used to get to her outside room. I hold onto the gate and press my face against the bars as if I want to press right through this barrier. I look at the kitchen window, the back door and the washing line full of baby clothes, little white vests and pink jackets. I didn't know that the new people had a baby. I wonder if they know that my father was shot dead in their lunch. It's probably not the type of, of thing that an estate agent tells you when she wants to sell her house. The back door opens, my heart breaks into tiny pieces as I see Rebecca walking towards the washing line. Impossible! But, it's, but it is Becca's thin black body, Becca's tar feet in her slops, Becca's familiar light pink overall. It can't be. Becca doesn't work here anymore. My mother helped her to find other work before we went to England. We had sent her postcards, the first, 
the first year and then we had lost contact. Someone had let us know that she no longer worked at the same address. And now she is here, standing at the washing line. Of course, it is she, the woman who looked, who looked after me when I was a baby, the body that I know better than my mother's, busy packing the clothes of a stranger's baby into a plastic basket. I shake the, ga the gate to her ga get her attention. It has to be her, but she's too far to hear anything. Rebecca! The voice that bursts out of my throat frightens me. It doesn't sound human. More like a dying animal, a cow bellowing, or something like that. The woman turns around, comes closer, uncertain. Becca! I try again. A horse rattle. Once when my dad at laryngitis, it sounded like that. Is it you? No, Ekie! Her face bursts open with joy. She drops the basket with the baby clothes onto the lawn and comes running towards the gate. Pushes her rough hands through the bars, cups my face in her hands, laughs in the amazement. No, Ekie, it's you! I laugh and cry at the same time. She takes a bunch of keys out of the pocket of her pink overall and unlocks the gate. Her hands are shaking. She pulls me close to her and presses me against her. I didn't know how much I had missed this body. The smell of clean washing and spices and, pot and potatoes. Nobody in England smells like this. No one in the whole world smells like this. Anouk! My mother calls as she appears around the corner. Anouk! Rebecca! It's me, madam. She wants to let go of me, but I cling to her. The child is very happy to see me. But what are you? Are you working? What are you? Are you working here again? My mother's voice is high with profound surprise. Her, her face overwhelmed. My grand stands behind her, her mouth wide open. Things didn't go well with the other people, madam. Rebecca sounds embarrassed, like when she had burnt some food, as if she is scared that mom will be cross. And then I heard that these people were having a baby and they were looking for someone to help them. I missed having a child in the house. My mother hugs Rebecca, but all the time she is looking at me, at my tear-stained face and at my laughing mouth. Do they treat you well? Granny wants to know from Rebecca. Very good, madam. And the little one is so cute. She reminds me a lot of Noiki when she was a baby and has such round, curious eyes she will probably ask just as many questions when she begins to talk. I laugh a brief rattle, and my mother's hand flies to her mouth. Hanuk has stopped talking. Her red, red lipstick is slightly smudged, her eyes hidden behind her sunglasses. She has stopped laughing, I thought. She spoke to me. Becca says proudly, teasingly as if my mother has just made a joke. She screamed, she screamed like a mad one when she saw me. Anouk! My name is Noekia. I say in my strange new voice, a bit less hoarse with each word. For the first time in four years, it is my mother who is speechless. She stares at me, the tears dripping from under her, glasses, her sunglasses. You know, I don't like to be called Anouk. And with every word that comes out of my mouth, I sound more like my mother. So, this story is actually a very, is actually astonishingly beautiful. It's, it's really a great, um, 
and profound look into into the identity of this girl that loses his father and stops to talk so she stops to talk and her mother didn't and her mother was there yes she tried to help her talk again but she didn't understand the real the real issue that was threatening the identity of of Noeke. The issue was that the change that had happened in her life after the death of her father actually closed her inside her own her own barriers and her own mind and she felt not understood because when she was smaller the only two people that were to get that were with her were Rebecca and her father and as soon as she sees Rebecca again she's actually profoundly touched and she manages to pass her own obstacles and her, and her own barriers <laughs> and she starts living again so this is a this is a beautiful story and i hope you enjoyed it